Okay, as I said, we're not going to have a, a formal break, and I'm not going to tell you to go and drink because all of you will go and drink at the same time. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask our two provocateurs to actually start speaking, and then I let you to determine Testing. when Testing. you want to go out and get a drink. Testing. Yes, so, Testing. Um, so if I can invite um, KK Chan and uh, Liam Salter to come um, and sit up here, and Testing. we're going to give them mics. They're not going to speak from here. They're going to speak from there. Um, KK, KK was formerly with CLP, and he was in charge of the renewable sector, but he's gone on to even bigger and better things. He went to work for another company up in Beijing in the climate change energy area, but most importantly, he has now formed his own company. He tells me he's a small of the small SMEs, but he's putting himself up in Beijing, and he is in the energy and renewable energy business full time. So I think that tells you something. And in our brief chat just now before um, uh, we started the session, he said, a lot of business up there, a lot of business up there, right? So I'm sure you are the converts. You know already energy, renewable energy is big time in the world, big time in China, and I think big time for the investment community and the business community in Hong Kong. And if we haven't got that message, I hope you'll go away getting that message today. Then our next provocateur is uh, Liam Salter. He was formerly with WWF, and he headed up their climate change program in Hong Kong. But he has also gone on to uh, bigger and better things. Uh, he's smaller and, smaller and better. Yes, that's true. You know, big sometimes can mean small, right, in terms of quality. But um, he's one of, I think, Hong Kong's amazing um, assets in terms of his knowledge in many of the environmental and climate areas. So we're very pleased to have you here. Uh, and he works also between the nonprofit and the for-profit sector, uh, which, is, um, which is terrific for people like us that we're able to tap into his knowledge. So if I can just ask the two of you to comment on what you heard so that uh, to, to pose questions just to kick off a discussion. And you know, please keep it as short as possible because I think I can see people bursting with all kinds of questions and comments. So if I can ask KK to go first. Thank you, Christine. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks, in particular, at Civic Exchange to give me an opportunity to speak to all of you here. Um, as Christine said, um, I'm starting up my own uh, private equity firm, which means that I'm selling a lot of assets now in Hong Kong to, quick, to get some liquidity. Um, and after this, I'm going to queue up for the Hang Seng Bank small to medium-sized enterprise for a small loan uh, to help my organization. Um, I have been um, working in the renewable sector for the last five, six years since the CLP days. And I think that I, I quite enjoy it because not only we are making money, but I think that we are also doing quite a lot for our planet. Um, for the last five to six years, I have invested in um, probably seven or eight wind farms all across in Asia, mainly in China, though. Mainly in China, though. Um, the experience I got for wind power has been very encouraging, um, particularly the strong support from the PRC governments has given, particularly for the uh, electricity tariff and other incentives. So that's why I've been long-term um, bullish on wind. Um, for solar energy, which is another big topic of the discussions for today, as an ex-scientist uh, doing a lot of research in thin thin technology, I like the sector. As a private equity investor, I don't like the sector because the valuation has been too high. Um, after the financial crisis, we know that and we've seen a lot of downward trend adjustment in the valuation, which means that a lot of um, potential opportunities in the solar sector has now become more appealing to investors. Um, as an example, for the last three months, four months, uh, once every two weeks or so, I will get a call from somebody that I never met in my whole life saying that they got a solar panel company on sale, but I need to come up with the money in two weeks. Things like that happen all the time. So I think that um, solar, when it comes to a more reasonable valuation, it should be a good opportunity for us. Another dynamic which will change the entire picture quite a lot will be the um, development of solar plant, in power plant in China. As Robin just mentioned, um, 
China has yet to see any big scale um, solar power plants yet. Although people have been talking about it for a lot of years. The main reason, and probably the only reason why it hasn't succeeded yet, is simply because NDRC has yet to give incentive strong enough to a solar power company. So we know that wind power is expensive, and talking about solar, you're talking about multiple of that cost. So who is going to pay for the electricity tariff? Now we know that NDLC is very keen to put a demonstration project up in Dunhuang, in the far west, uh, which supposedly should give very good tariff. The question is, how stable, how persistent will this tariff level will stay? Because don't forget in China, you're not going to get a 20-year long-term power purchase agreement with a fixed tariff. So your tariff will be renewed year on year. So this year, you get a very good tariff. What about five years from now? And for an expensive investment um, in solar power plant, I don't think that people will be up for the challenge to risk the capital. So these are the, some of the challenges for, for the solar power. And I think that I've been, while I've been listening to all the three speakers, what we can do in Hong Kong, what we can do in the Pearl River Delta, you know, I have to, I have to admit that, you know, in my investment mindset, I never bear this in mind, what we should do in Pearl River Delta or, or just in Hong Kong, because so long as we are doing, you know, things in the climate change area, we are improving uh, or easing of the climate change issues no matter where we are doing it. That's not normal. We can do wind farms in Australia, we can do wind farms in India, which can serve the purpose of reducing carbon emission. One and just per river data. But clearly, Hong Kong is our hometown. No doubt we want to make sure that it is as prosperous as before, and we should be highly involved in this green uh, development as well. So if you look at the competitive advantages of, of Hong Kong or, or Pearl River Delta, Unlike 20 years ago in China, where you know even Shanghai or Beijing is, was lacking of capital, nowadays everybody, you know, can have very very, you know, significant amount of liquidity to do their own investment. That, that's very very little advantage for Hong Kong or Pearl River Delta to sell on that. But that's still one thing that I think that we do have is our talents. We have very strong research um, um, capability and capacity in Hong Kong or you know, in the Pearl River Delta. We still have very skilled labor uh, force in the Pearl River Delta, which when we talk about high technology in the green tech space, such as wind turbine, solar panel, we do have a lot of backup and resources in this regard um, to develop what we want to develop in the Pearl River Delta. Um, if you look at the other places of China, like Shanghai, um, Suzhou, Sunjun, obviously, and even in Chengdu of Sichuan. These places are now occupied by wind turbine manufacturers. They are occupied by uh, solar panel manufacturers already. Relatively speaking, you look at Pearl River Delta, there are only a handful, very limited number of, of these people. Why? Because the land cost in Pearl River Delta is very expensive, relatively to places like Chengdu or even in Tianjin, for example. Uh, we see a lot of wind turbine manufacturers, world class, such as Vestas, Gamesa, Susnon, you name it. They all started their manufacturing capability in Tianjin, which, in my opinion, is only a second line, second, line, second tier um, cities, um, in my humble opinion. Why can't we do it in Pearl River Delta? In fact, a few months ago, when I looked into an investment case in uh, Pearl River Delta, actually in, Shen, uh, in Zhongshan, um, they are a very good manufacturer of wind turbines. However, they are expanding the capability and capacity of production into far um, northwest, sorry, north east, north -east of China, um, including Xi'an and etc., Shenyang, etc. So why? Because simply, they can turn the land in Guangdong into a real estate project and making more money than making money from selling wind turbines. So this is the hard fact, whether you like it or not. But however, um, I, I just I don't want to close it by a very negative uh, feeling about we can't do anything in Peru. I think we do, we can. Um, it's a matter of how we can utilize the 
technology transfer uh, capability that Hong Kong has been very good at in the last couple of decades. Uh, Guangdong is very good at in the, la in the last couple of decades. We have solar technology, we have energy efficiency uh, technologies, like the, simple, uh, the simplest way is the efficient light bulb, for example. This type of technologies will, will survive, and this is something that I, I think that we should be looking at. Thank you. Um, Reset is, is, a, is a company that's focused on, on selling carbon services. So, so we use carbon as a tool for driving consumers, whether it is a manufacturing companies, property companies, and so on, to uh, lower their carbon emissions to become more energy efficient. Um, so the perspective I'm going to give you is very much a, a carbon perspective and, and a consumer perspective. I think if we, if we look at the market now for renewables in China, we don't see a very strong carbon signal here yet. I mean, most of the, the activity is driven by government policy, and most of that policy is not driven by carbon. So, so the carbon push, if you like, is, is yet to come. Um, I think a lot of the speakers talked about the potential for the future, um, and I think we, we may need to bear in mind this future may come a bit faster than we anticipate. Um, there's some interesting work that the Tyndall Center did on where China would need to go if it was going to contribute on an equitable basis, which is essentially government policy, towards a, a, a climate protection target in 2050. Um, so these scenarios basically mapped out a, a, a range of about, hold on, about 400 gigawatts to 700 gigawatts of wind and over 250 gigawatts of solar by 2050. Now, now, if we're going to transition to that kind of uh, scale, then, then actually we need to start moving fairly quickly. Obviously, there's a, there's a sequencing in this. Uh, most of the scenarios show that the energy efficiency stuff comes first, then the wind and the PV stuff and the solar stuff starts picking up from 2030 onwards. But these are huge, huge volumes. And if essentially the choice is between you know, uh, climate change or, or 250 gigawatts of solar, then something has to give. And it may well be that we see a lot more incentives coming a lot faster down the pipeline um, um, than we're anticipating at the moment. Uh, in terms of the short term, I think uh, the Copenhagen process will give us the first sight of what the longer term carbon price might look like. I don't think it'll give us a very uh, robust insight, but it might give us a ballpark. When, when um, at WWF we looked at, at the um, how much carbon was contributing towards renewable energy projects in terms of in terms of income, and we found that you know a wind project was typically getting about 10% of its capital costs from a carbon revenue stream, and a small hydro nearly 20%. That's at about 10 to 12 dollars a ton. Um, we expect, or a lot of the the, the medium-term carbon price scenarios are showing much higher price signals than that. So we could see a, a carbon price movement that has a big impact on the market um, sooner than we think, and we can see people positioning for that world sooner than we think. So, so the idea that change kind of comes at some indeterminate point in the future, I think it could be a lot more rapid as we start to understand what we need to do now in order to be safe in 2050. Um, the other area that, that our company is, is uh, looking at is essentially um, Know, how consumers are driving demand for low carbon products and services of various kinds. We see two interesting areas. First of all, you know, and this is uh, uh, something that Iceberg picked up on, the, the idea for, for low carbon products from Western markets. You know, there's consistently reliable data showing that 40 odd percent of consumers are willing to pay some kind of small premium for a product uh, in a supermarket that can demonstrate that it is a low carbon product. You know, and companies like Tesco's are sufficiently confident in this analysis to commit to, six, to labeling 60,000 on, on, on shelf products. So, I, I mean, it's fairly robust, and a lot of the retailers are positioning themselves to, to look into this market. Um, if you're a manufacturer and, and you want to achieve carbon neutrality, for example, you've got two choices on, on site renewable energy or carbon offsets. And uh, if we're discussing about the price of carbon going up, then the relative uh, economics of solar on site for example, become more attractive um, quite quickly. Uh, the other area I think that, that's a good one is, is buildings. Um, we see a lot of uh, grade A commercial tenants in Hong Kong have carbon targets. Uh, some of them are carbon neutral. 
And I think at the moment there's a bit of a disconnect between the occupiers and the property developers uh, in terms of uh, how these two entities can work together to help the tenants achieve their targets and help the developers make their buildings uh, uh, greener. But, uh, but again, I see here a strong consumer driver. I mean, essentially, if you're a company, I mean, HSBC is the obvious one, but if you're carbon neutral as a company, you have a choice again carbon offsets or, or embedded renewables in your building, which makes the economics of those embedded renewables more positive. So, I mean, I think in the short term, um, we will see strengthening drivers for, for this market, um, uh, even in Hong Kong and, and, and PRD, despite the limited size of the overall resource. I don't actually think that's the thing to focus on in this debate. I think we should be focusing on the value uh, of these technologies to our economies. And I think we can see uh, uh, some pretty big opportunities uh, uh, particularly from the stuff that you can embed into your facilities and your buildings in the short term and in the longer term, um, some big macro drivers that, that should uh, deliver significant penetrations into the Chinese market and drive uh, less economic sites. I mean, if you have to install 400 gigawatt of wind to achieve climate protection, you're probably coming below six meters a second. Thanks. Okay, now um, open to your comments and your contributions and your questions. Testing. Yes, at the back. Can you tell us who you are and then please ask your question? Yeah, I'm Trevor from uh, OVR and Partners, engineering consultants. I'd like to ask the speakers about other than uh, solar power and hydro and the wind, what do they think of the potential of um, biomass? Because say, for example, in the UK, um, all the eco towns have adopted some sort of biomass boilers or CHP as a short to medium term solution. And uh, is it a viable option in China, and more, more particularly southern China? Sure. Oh, I forgot to do one thing, which is to invite our other three uh, key speakers to come and join us. So may I ask you just to come here first? Uh, whilst they're moving, let me start answering your question. I think the answer is definitely yes. Uh, at the last count, there are, I think, several hundred biomass little projects all over China. Now, we haven't uh, uh, actually spent time looking at that one, uh, but it is, a, uh, uh, it is an omission uh, for today. Uh, but I do think biomass burn you know, is definitely, definitely something that uh, there's a lot of uh, potential. But perhaps somebody can help me to fill out some details. KK. Yeah, I'm, I'm a big time fan of um, biomass power. Um, I like the farmers, I like to deal with them. Um, the, obviously the key challenges for um, developing um, biomass power is the feedstock supply. Um, how you collect the feedstock from the farmers. Um, if you travel in, in the fields in China, you often see all these um, straws, you know, whether it's from cotton stock or, or from others, rice husk, whatever. You know, they, they're just totally ignored by, by the farmers and, and they need to deal with it. Um, in, in many places like Shandong, they even burn it in the open field, which is actually strictly forbidden by, by the government because it's created a lot of smoke, a lot of you know, pollution, etc. But still, the farmers are, are, are burning because they've got no ways to um, deal with the mess. Um, however, when you start to purchase the straws and all these cotton stock from these guys, they start to, to ask you for money. Obviously, you're happy to give them some money, let's say 200, tons, 200 RMB per ton of cotton stock. But, but once they know that you, know, you have to rely on the field for that, they will increase the price you know, continuously. Um, that's the universal problem of, of biomass operators. So luckily, I'm not, I'm not um, managing this um, type of projects anymore. So it's someone else's problem, not mine. <laughs> Uh, can I, that's, there was another question in front, yeah. at the back. Okay, she the just back gave first. me the phone, so uh, that means she wants me to ask the question. Uh, this is Dominic Yin, Chairman of Hong Kong Association of Energy Service Companies. In my opinion, I think offshore wind power is the only thing we should do it in the southern part of China. All the others are wasting time and money. All we should do is concentrate in doing energy efficiency. Uh, do you agree? That's my simple question. Thank you. I would have thought the answer is probably a resounding yes from everybody. Is that right? Oh. Yes. 
Please, the question in front. Uh, yes, uh, Patrick Budden, Asianet. Um, we've heard a lot about the difficulties in uh, dealing with uh, natural power. I think uh, that we avoided nuclear power. Don't you think that? Uh, don't you think that nuclear power really is the way to go? That uh, it's easier to generate power from nuclear power and it's cleaner. Yes, I'm sure many of you can reply to this. Perhaps I, I, I can have um, uh, both CLP and um, uh, also what? Do you answer? Yes. Um, I, um, <laughs> I I raised the point quite early on in my talk that for the moment. Um, uh, it's fossil fuel that's been scaled. Nuclear is the next thing that can be scaled up to provide carbon-free energy, but it's a stopgap um, uh, whilst you get in. It's, uh, to put in position, renewable energy is a much longer time frame. It's less scalable and it's much more relevant to a local, uh, local situation. So yes, I would agree with you that, that nuclear is the way to go. I think that if one looks at the um, uh, pieces of the jigsaw that China is putting into position in terms of supply of uranium, uh, both in Kazakhstan and down in Australia, you will see that their potential scale of um, nuclear power generation is actually much more than, uh, than they are predicting in public, and so therefore I see, um, uh, I see nuclear becoming quite a substantial part of China's power mix. Um, my partner uh, spoke at the um, APEC Business Forum on this two years ago, and between the two of us, we, we estimate that they could be uh, anything up at 20% within, within 15, 15 to 20 years from now. Richard? Uh, I'll just uh, add a few comments to that. It, it's on. It's, it's on. on. But put okay. it closer to your mouth. Okay. Yes. Is that better? Uh, the scale of nuclear power is uh, you know, vast in comparison to renewable power. What, what can be achieved by developing nuclear power will have um, a, a big impact on uh, reducing carbon. Nuclear power doesn't emit carbon dioxide. Um, the, the technology is available, it's commercially viable, and, and has been around for a number of years. Uh, it is being developed in a big scale in China. And uh, we at uh, CLP certainly see that if we're looking at reducing carbon emissions on the scale that we need to, and uh, whether you uh, Look at it in terms of the stabilization wedges that Stanford University have published. Uh, we need to get a number of technologies up to a scale where they can reduce carbon emissions by each of them a billion tons a year. So uh, we cannot afford to ignore nuclear power. We also cannot afford to ignore renewables. We must do as much as we can on energy efficiency and, and all of these are gonna be part of the solution. Yes. yes. Hi, Jim McGuire from uh, Marsh Inc. A question and a comment, or a comment and a question first. On nuclear, I think that everybody agreed it's a good idea, but to get back to the intention of the forum, you know, what moves the needle to a green PRD? Um, the development process in nuclear in China, as Richard, you well know, uh, is long at best. So let me rephrase Dominic's question. What can Hong Kong and PRD, respective governments, do in respect of energy efficiency um, Liam, I think you commented on some of the movements, but what I think we've missed in Dominic's question is, how do you mobilize money and how do you mobilize public policy to move the needle? Because I think renewable energy is great, clean tech's great. What moves the needle on green PRD is energy efficiency. So how do we take 85,000 factory owners from Hong Kong operating in the PRD and move them towards energy efficient manufacturing? Well, I think we welcome comments from the floor because I know that there are quite a number of people here who have looked into this area and who can comment extremely intelligently about the policy transit that is needed. So as I said, uh, rather than just put all the burden on uh, our guest here, uh, I think quite a number of you are probably able to offer perspective here as well. Um, but whilst you may be afraid to put your hand up and have a go, uh, perhaps uh, Liam, can I ask you to take this one? Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, um, what works with energy efficiency is a comprehensive approach. I mean, you need several measures deployed, you know, together to, to have a, a strong impact. If we look at, um, you know, Hong Kong has a, has, a, 
has an energy efficiency target of, I think, 20% in 25 years. Um, or is it 25% in 25 years? It's, I mean, it's that, the APEC. It's the APEC figure. Yeah, that's actually less than it achieved in the last 25 years. So, so, uh, uh, and and by comparison, you know, mainland has a has a target of 20% in five years. So, I mean, you know, what we have in Hong Kong at the moment is not. Um, we don't have a framework for assembling a range of measures that we need to drive efficiency into place. Typically, if you look at um, another economy, you'll see a range of different things come in. You need minimum building codes and minimum standards for appliances. They need to be mandatory. Um, you need incentives for premium products to pull the top of the market out. So, so you need a, a very good labeling schemes, and they need, need to be extremely well marketed. Um, you need finance. I think one of the key things that we observe in the market right now, particularly in the manufacturing sector, is a lot of companies interested in improving their energy efficiency, recognizing that they have significant savings within their facilities, but unwilling to commit their capital right now to this kind of investment. So, what, I mean, I think really a strategic approach is required. A target at the top of it needs to then drive a range of different measures underneath that both take the, the, the rubbish out of the market, if you like, in terms of the take the, the capital stock that's inefficient out of the market and prevent it being sold, and then Im improve the incentives and the visibility of the top line stuff. R Richard, perhaps I can ask you a bit on this as well. There's always a concern in political circles about things costing more. You know, there's always this almost scare tactic that if we're going to be more energy efficient, then we have to have negotiation with the two power companies. And I think we have friends here also from uh, Hong Kong Electric. Uh, we're going to pay more. And the people will resist this. So when we're looking at trying to define a new uh, regulatory base, a new pricing base for a green PRD, a much more efficient, uh, energy efficient PRD, uh, a much more low carbon PRD, um, how do you foresee, as one of the major monopolies here, I mean, how do you foresee this path is possible? We hear from you, and maybe there are some other people out there who are not in the operation business who might have a different perspective. Richard. Okay, uh, it's, it's a question that very often comes up. Um, the, the idea of being incentivized to be more energy efficient, um, you know, I think we inherently have an incentive to use less energy. Uh, the less energy we use, the less we pay for our electricity bill. So, so we already have that, that incentive there. I think as, as the power company, um, we operate here, we provide the power that our customers ask for. Uh, we work with our customers to try and help them become more energy efficient. And we, we see our role in uh, a number of areas. One is education and just making people aware of what can be done to be more energy efficient. Um, we work with uh, community groups. We work with customers directly. We provide a free audit service to go and uh, go into customers' premises, uh, give them advice on how to be more energy efficient. Uh, we have um, an eco home that's been set up in a shop front in Mong Kok where you can go and see a range of innovative ideas on how to be more energy efficient. Uh, everything from instantaneous water heaters, uh, induction cookers. Some of these are very new product products that we have uh, worked with product manufacturers to, to develop. So there's, there's one role in, in education that, that we have. Uh, a second area is in awareness and raising awareness. Um, we have programs that we work through uh, the community, also working with schools to, uh, to raise awareness with, with school children. And uh, the third area that we see is just uh, a, a, being a role model in the community. We have uh, been working on energy efficiency programs within our own facilities for many years. Uh, we uh, produce the electricity in Hong Kong. If we can get uh, the most efficient plant to produce it, then uh, you know, if we can save 1% uh, on our efficiency, it's eff effectively uh, saving 1% for the whole of Hong Kong. So we see a role in getting all of our facilities as, as efficiently as possible. Now, when it comes to uh, the question of regulations, uh, building efficiency, there are roles that others in the community can play as well. Uh, the property developers, the government setting standards, uh, all of these are, are areas that every sector of the community can, can contribute. And as individuals as well, there, there are areas that we can contribute just by being aware and uh, 
taking steps within our own homes to buy efficient appliances, to make sure that we conserve energy and, uh, and only use what we really need. Um, may I ask Bill, yes, um, give us a kind of more comprehensive picture, really the policy transit that we really need, because I suggest most of the things, Richard, that you've mentioned aren't going to be enough, except the bit that you didn't expand on, which is the policy bit. So perhaps, Bill, you can help us. Well, the bottom line is uh, energy will have to be far more expensive in the future. It's far too cheap today. And there's no escape from that. If we want a world in which we emit far less carbon, that's a world in which far less energy overall is used until the day we have technological breakthroughs that are sort of just barely imagined today. So the point is that, yes, people don't want to pay, nobody likes to pay higher prices, but energy is too cheap. And that is why we admit so much carbon, because we don't pay a price for it. And until we do, uh, it's always going to be playing catch up. So that's that and the idea of constant economic growth in the form of mere quantitative expansion of the things that we produce. We don't even consume them, it's more throughput. That driver plus the fact that energy is just vastly underpriced, the future has to address both of those things and until then, the, I mean, the, what people have described here is the scale of how difficult it will be to move to the levels, and even what they're talking about for 2050, uh, as Liam suggested, may well be too low and, and too long in coming, that we may have to move farther and faster. So anyway. Uh, Liam, you would like to have a go. Just to, to stab at it, I would say something on the order, I mean, $100 is where I would start, a ton of carbon. That's where I would begin. Now, I realize that's something that would, that would involve a <laughs> fundamental change in the way things are done. But that's what we're talking about. If we are talking about having a world economy that reduces its carbon emissions by 80% in 40 years, my God. You know, it has to be something. And $20 a ton is not going to do it. I mean, I don't know what the actual price is. And I would actually say, you know, you begin at 100 and kind of go up. I think um, James Hansen, although he doesn't actually propose an actual price, illustrates his carbon tax proposal with, I think, 115 or $130, something in that range. And that struck me as one of the most realistic numbers that I've actually heard. Okay, for anybody who don't know who Jim Hansen is, he's the head of NASA, uh, the Goddard Institute uh, in the U.S.